So thanks very much for having me here. It's a, it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to tell you about my research. So I'm based at the Department of Statistics uh, in Oxford, uh, part of a bigger group uh, there who focuses on uh, statistical machine learning and computational statistics. My research is mainly on statistical machine learning and in particular methods that are based on the underlying mathematical framework of, uh, of reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. And in particular, I'm interested in how you can use representations of probability distributions in these spaces and do interesting things with them. Uh, so this is, I guess, a, a longer thread of my research. Uh, in particular today, what I would like to do is give you an overview of this framework and uh, two recent applications of it in the context of meta-learning. And as we will see, there will be two specific uh, meta-learning applications. One will be hyperparameter learning and the other one will be conditional density estimation. Uh, so this is just the overview of the talk. Uh, so for some preliminaries on these kernel embeddings, those will be the main tools that I will use throughout. And then we'll discuss hyperparameter learning uh, for distributional transfer, which is an application of this framework in the context of learning hyperparameters across many tasks uh, jointly. And the second one will be meta-learning for conditional density estimation. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, so there will be now a, a few definitions just to uh, set the notation and uh, to sort of give you a, a sense of the kinds of mathematical objects that I tend to work with. Uh, so we start essentially with an abstract set X uh, and that will be inputs to my machine learning algorithm that could be essentially anything. Uh, we don't have any structure on the set. We don't have any geometry on that set. And then we will have a feature mapping from that set, uh, let's call it phi. Uh, the feature mapping phi sends us to some other space that we will call feature space. And that space will be denoted H. And that space has some structure, and in particular has inner product structure. So once I've defined the feature mapping and I move to the feature, uh, feature space, I'm essentially identifying elements of my original space with elements of another set, that feature space, on which some structure already exists. Uh, in particular, we care about inner products in this context. Inner product is already defined. Once we have a notion of an inner product now transferred to our original domain, we can use linear algorithms. Uh, and that's basically all we somehow can do with machine learning, just use linear algorithms. So uh, this is a very broad definition, according to this definition, almost anything we do in machine learning is, is a kernel method, right? Because it is based on taking some objects in some abstract domain and uh, endowing them with geometry based on a feature mapping. Okay. Uh, so now that part, that almost anything can be viewed as a kernel method is true, uh, but not uh, necessarily the most interesting uh, statement because often very interesting statement is how we end up with these transformations, how we learn these representations given by phi. So uh, nonetheless, uh, the mathematical formalism for any fixed feature mapping remains and that's what I uh, tend to focus on in my work. That mathematical formalism is inescapable for given feature maps. This framework essentially tells us what we can do with these representations, how we can combine them in a meaningful way uh, in order to facilitate them in some decision-making pipeline. Uh, they, for example, tell us what sort of new criteria can we derive for the problems at hand, how we can mix different representations together uh, and define new interesting models and objective functions. Uh, so indeed, here, we will be learning those feature mappings with deep learning framework. But that's not what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is how I combine those feature mappings uh, in interesting ways. OK. Um, so one thing that allows us to think about feature mappings using kernels is uh, this fact here that when I define a notion of an inner product of my original domain through the feature mapping, uh, that feature mapping and feature space are not necessarily unique. So there are many possible versions of feature maps and feature spaces that give me exactly the same uh, notion of an inner product. But that notion of an inner product, that structure is, and that's what we call kernel. Okay. Um, so this is an abstract definition. 
of a particular instantiation of this feature space that we tend to work with because this is the mathematically, mo mathematically the most convenient one. So if I think about the feature space as a space of some functions, and that space of functions satisfies two uh, properties given here, two ab abstract properties, I can find some function k such that if I fix one uh, uh, argument of that uh, function, and I treat it as an argument of, uh, 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 as a function of the second argument that's here denoted by a dot, that function lives in my space H. And moreover, this is somehow a very special element of the space in that it actually reproduces or represents evaluations of functions in the space. So if I take an inner product between F and this object K dot X, I always get just an evaluation of F at X. So that structure, uh, that mathematical object, essentially gives us one feature space because if this is true, then of course, <coughs> kernel itself is just an inner product between these objects, okay? That allows us to do something interesting. I no longer need to care about the very specific feature mapping phi here, which could correspond to, say, coordinates of these functions in some basis, which is not unique. I only deal with the function itself. And that's why this feature space is called canonical feature space, and this is called a canonical feature map that associates to every point x a kernel function where one or argument is fixed to x. So uh, often can be instructive, sometimes can be a little bit misleading, but often we think about kernels as similarity measures. So here you associate to every individual point a prototype similarity measure of that with everything else in the space, okay? And uh, that's a feature representation of my individual point. So uh, luckily, once we have this uh, kernel function k, we can forget all about the feature mapping and work only with the kernel and indeed, uh, there is a characterization of these functions uh, given by function analysis. So these are sort of classical results uh, from the beginnings of the 20th century that as long as a function k is positive definite, so it satisfies a certain uh, property that translates to the properties of matrices associated to, the, to, to these functions, uh, that is a valid kernel. So for that, there is some feature mapping and there's some feature space, but we don't really care about uh, explicit coordinates of those feature maps. Okay, so this is very classical. Uh, this is bread and butter, a lot of machine learning in the 90s. Um, this is what facilitated the advent of nonlinear support vector machines and many other nonlinear methods uh, where we essentially just said, well, what we would typically do, we would take some data object and extract some quantitative measures of that data object, stick them into a big, big vector, then work with that vector. So instead of doing that, we work with this implicit representation, k dot x, okay? And that k dot x has some representation like that, but I don't care what it is. The only thing I care about is that inner products in this representations are available, so my structure is already there, okay? Uh, so what my research is focusing on is essentially just one step further from this very classical kernel trick where we will work with probability distributions. So now we'll take this canonical feature representation k dot x and I will just take its expectation over some probability distribution, okay? This will give me a representation of a probability distribution, not of an individual point, but of a whole probability distribution. And if you think about how in classical uh, probability and statistics, how we represent probability distributions, usually we represent them using means and covariances and things like that. So means and covariances are indeed just expectations of some features. So if I would take expectation of x itself, that will give me a mean. If, we'll, if, if I have expectation of xx transpose, that will give me a covariance and so on and so forth, right? So now again, rather than having a representation like that, I have this implicit representation, which is a function, and I just work with that function. That will again correspond to some explicit uh, representation like that, but I don't necessarily <coughs> care about that. The only thing I care about is that if I now take inner product of two kernel embeddings, two representations of probability measures, that itself just ends up being an expectation of the kernel function itself, which is now something that's extremely easy to estimate. Yeah? It's just an expectation. So now I endow the space of probability distributions with some structure, with some geometry, and I can work with that. Uh, so 
it's a very simple idea, uh, and yet it has been extremely useful uh, starting from 2005, say, uh, onwards in constructing a framework for non-parametric hypothesis testing, uh, for the two-sample problem, for independence, conditional independence, interaction testing, causal discovery, and so on and so forth. So in particular, because uh, you can essentially start with any generic domain, these would lead to things like non-parametric two-sample test on graph data or on image data, things like that, in a mathematically principled fashion. Okay, so uh, the simplest possible thing we can do with these representations of probability distributions, we can compute distances between them, okay? And this is what's called maximum mean discrepancy or MMD. MMD between two probability distributions, P and Q, is basically just a distance in this Hilbert space of two embeddings, okay? The name comes from an interesting interpretation of this probability distance in that it can also be written in this way. It is pulling apart expectations with respect to two probability distributions, so the blue one x and the red one a y, as much as possible. It's finding a function when I push these x and y, this x and y through the function, the expectation is as large as possible. And that is, Optimization is done over a particular space of functions. If this space of function happens to be exactly the unit ball in this RPHS, we get back our MMD. So you can think about this green function that uh, achieved the supremum here as uh, some kind of witness for the difference between two probability distributions. Of course, this is a one-dimensional example, which is not very interesting because we have a lot of classical tools for one-dimensional examples, but this works for very generic domains as well. Uh, it turns out that uh, for a very broad class of kernels, uh, this is actually a proper distance on probability measures in a sense that it characterizes equality in distributions. And of course, I can encode structural properties in the data, the data lives on a torus and things like that, that there are uh, appropriate kernels for uh, those structures and so on. Okay. So uh, it's been used quite widely for various applications. Uh, I'm just listing a couple here, essentially. Uh, things like training deep generative models, uh, even uh, in the early days, uh, using MMD as a criterion. Um, could be used as a, uh, as a uh, objective for traversing manifolds that are learned by some uh, very complex feature representations and so on and so forth, okay? And the reason why it's so widely used, it's, it's such a simple thing because it's actually, when you square MMD, you just get expectations because you just get uh, Hilbert space distance, which is squared, so it's just inner products, and inner products are uh, very easy to estimate, okay? So very easy to estimate, works on generic domains, hence very widely applicable, okay? Some other things I can, uh, so that's the estimator. So some other things I can do uh, with kernel embeddings is I can ask uh, questions along the lines, well, what if I have a supervised learning setup, but I don't just have vectorial inputs. The inputs themselves could be sets of samples from some probability distributions, okay? So this is a, just a cartoon example, just to give you a, a sense of what's going on. So here I'm assuming uh, I have some underlying probability distributions I see some samples from those probability distributions, and the label that I'm trying to learn is the entropy of those probability distributions. So the label is a function of a probability distribution itself, not of any individual sample that I've seen, okay? So, of course, in order to facilitate the learning process, now we have to get some structure on the space of probability distributions, and these kernel embeddings give us a very convenient way of doing that, okay? And we'll see in uh, my application that uh, this is essentially what we end up doing. Okay, uh, so that's basically, and uh, by all means, feel free to interrupt me at any point with, with any questions. Uh, so uh, that concludes this overview of the framework. So now I will give you two specific uh, applications, applications in the context of meta-learning, as I mentioned. So this is joint work with my students, Leon uh, Lowe and uh, Jean-Francois Ton. Uh, Lucian Chen, uh, some colleagues from uh, Tencent AI, and uh, Yu Te, who is uh, a colleague at the Department of Statistics. So uh, I will 
start with the problem of hyperparameter learning. So essentially, for both of these applications, there is one conceptual similarity. They are actually very different problems. But the idea is that I'm running some learning or inference procedure across a bunch of data sets, that is tasks, and these tasks share certain s structures, share certain similarity. So I can facilitate this framework of kernel embeddings to represent relevant distributions in these tasks in order to borrow strength across tasks. In order to transfer information between the tasks so, can, so that I can make my procedures either faster or more data efficient. So hyperparameter learning. Um, so that's the, uh, somehow one of the ultimate goals uh, of uh, what we're doing here, right? So the ultimate goal is this idea of end-to-end -end learning. Uh, the dream is that we have raw data coming in and meaningful predictions going out. There's no human in the loop. There are no interventions. Everything happens automatically. Uh, so that's also one of the very uh, compelling cases for deep learning because deep learning is bringing us closer towards that goal. But we're not quite there yet. It is basically still a dream, right? So here's the picture that we wish to see. Machine learning algorithm in between, raw data in, output out. And that's really what's happening, right? So there is some hyperparameters of this machine learning algorithm that have to be tuned. And usually there is a human in the box, uh, some uh, graduate student or an intern who is tuning this machine learning algorithm, selecting hyperparameters, architectures, stitching together various choices of methodologies. And often that requires non-trivial expertise. And, um, um, even though it corresponds often to some ad hoc techniques like grid search, random search, right? So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's basically uh, somehow a challenge in automating machine learning. And uh, it's not just deep learning, it's essentially any machine learning model. Any machine learning model has hyperparameters to be tuned. You know, we often say that random forests are insensitive to hyperparameter tuning, but I will at the end give you an example where we're actually tuning hyperparameters of random forests, and that also can have a difference, um, can lead to different results. So, uh, so yeah, so all of these, Frameworks, I guess, deep learning, kernel methods, variational methods, they all have various parameters, various choices that we need to, uh, we need to, uh, we need to tune. So what is our objective function? Objective function is usually some measure of generalization performance, something uh, that is objective, uh, for a given set of hyperparameters. Uh, and in order to uh, ensure that there is no leakage, we usually use a held out data set or, or cross-validation. Uh, okay, so how is this dealt with, right? So of course it's a classical problem, and uh, it's a problem which we can call somehow optimizing black box functions, right? So there is some very complicated function that represents the relationship between hyperparameters and the performance that we care about. Uh, this we want to optimize over some, say, bounded domain. Minimization, maximization doesn't really matter here, whether it's one or the other, because these are uh, functions that are not convex or nice. Uh, we don't have them in any functional form. We only ever can evaluate them. Okay. And potentially these evaluations are noisy and extremely expensive because they mean training the whole machine learning model, but in general, they could also mean running a complex uh, physical experiment. Right, so uh, how, how can we facilitate this problem when we don't actually know what f is? So what we do is we build a probabilistic model for the objective for f. So we make some assumption, we assume that f is well behaved somehow, and we build a surrogate probabilistic model for f. Uh, one of the choices, it's not the only choice, but it's very common, is to use a Gaussian process. A Gaussian process is a probabilistic model in the sense that it gives us a whole pro posterior predictive distribution of the whole function f. That means it gives us mean uh, prediction of f. It also gives us predictive variances at all allocations that we could query. Okay. So that's very convenient 
because now we can also quantify our, uncert our uncertainty in F itself. So what we would typically do is that we would form a cheap proxy function, which is also called acquisition function, based on these predictive means and variances. This will take mean and uh, variance into, in, in account in a way that balances exploration and exploitation. I'll say a bit more about what that means on the next slide. And then we'll just evaluate the objective uh, at the optimum of the proxy. We will optimize the proxy instead of the objective and we'll find uh, the next point to query the actual objective. Okay. So uh, I'll just get a bit more concrete than that. Uh, so here, what's happening, the typical model is that we're usually assuming that the noise in the evaluations of our black box function here, performance measure of a machine learning model, is IID. And having evaluated the objective at some set of locations theta, observed values we will denote by y, two uh, function values will be denoted by these f of thetas uh, in boldface f. So that translates to the following simple probabilistic model. Boldface f, this vector is normal with some covariance structure specified by the kernel. So this is essentially the same kernel as the one from kernel embeddings I've told you about, but these are kind of two separate frameworks in machine learning. Uh, that remain distinct to this day, even though they are very subtle uh, uh, equivalences and things like that. But anyway, so uh, that's th that encodes structural assumptions about f, whether f we th where we think that f is smooth, whether we think say that f has a certain number of derivatives, whether we think that f is periodic, things like that. And then the likelihood itself of these evaluations just follows a normal model as well. That means that posterior is available in closed form posterior is also just normal. Okay. So now that we have the mean and the variance at any given theta, okay, any new uh, hyperparameter value that we wish to query, so it's all available just in closed form, we can construct these acquisition functions which balance exploitation exploration in the following sense. Exploitation means that we're seeking locations with low posterior mean, mu of theta, mu of theta is my current estimate of the function. I want to minimize that function, so I'm going for the low posterior mean, okay? But I'm not really equally certain about these values everywhere. So there are some locations with very high posterior variance. So for my exploration, I'm interested in those locations because those might be hiding actually even lower values, okay? So that's this exploitation exploration trade-off. And because everything here is normal, it turns out that we can just write down these acquisition functions in closed form. Uh, they correspond to, say, probability of impor improvement of a current optimum by evaluating it at a certain location or indeed to the size of that improvement. Okay. So here's just a simple illustration. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have seen Bayesian optimization before? Okay, quite a number, All right? So I guess I can... Uh, skip through some of these details. Uh, so, so, uh, so that's the story. So we have uh, the true function in red here. The predicted mean is in black. Uh, that's our proxy, which corresponds to expected improvement. We are optimizing the proxy. We end up querying now uh, the true function at that point. We see that observation. We update and we keep going until we converge to the optimum of the true function. Okay, great. So that now allows us uh, to replace this uh, human in the loop with a probabilistic model for f. So that's sometimes called learning to learn. Okay, so uh, using the output, we get some measure of performance evaluated at particular thetas, and probabilistic model tells us which thetas to query next. Okay. So what uh, this application of kernel embeddings is about is about transferring information across multiple hyperparameter learning tasks, okay? So we'll assume here that these uh, hyperparameter learning tasks share the same model. Hence, they have the same uh, uh, hyperparameter domain, 
which means that variability in F across tasks is due to changing data sets themselves. Okay. So what we're really doing here is challenging this paradigm that hyperparameter learning is a black box optimization, right? It's not really because we have very highly structured problem. It corresponds to training a specific model, and I know what that model is, on a specific data set, and I also know what the data set is. Okay. So data sets go in, and they are different, and these boxes correspond to the same models, and hence can I borrow strength across all of these different tasks in order to speed up Bayesian optimization. Okay. How are we going to do that? Well, we'll build a joint model, essentially, uh, where the variability across data sets will be captured directly as an input to our probabilistic model of the performance measure. Okay. So now I'm thinking of a performance measure, function I'm trying to optimize, as being both the function of the hyperparameters and of a particular data set. Okay. Now I'll have a uh, a data set in terms of inputs and outputs. I'm thinking of supervised learning here, but it's not necessarily uh, uh, applicable only to supervised learning as long as there is a, uh, an appropriate performance measure. So we will tackle this particular problem. Let's assume that we have already solved small and source tasks by computing a certain number of evaluations of the objective at those tasks. That means we have some uh, hyperparameters that we are queried the i model at, right? And there's n i of them, let's say. They are on specific data sets that we also know. And now the goal is to utilize information from these source tasks to help us model a target task, which has a new data set. Okay, so, and the goal is just to minimize the objective function for the target task. Here's just a simple motivated example. This is not too important. Uh, so this is an example that's usually used to motivate warm starting Bayesian optimization. How would you, given that you've solved previously uh, similar tasks, how would you just warm start Bayesian optimization? At which value of hyperparameters would you start? Uh, and uh, in this paper, they think about modeling uh, assignment of drivers to passengers in, in, in some of these uh, ride sharing applications and so on. Uh, because we have live stream of data arriving uh, in time, we want to deploy the model as soon as possible. Hence, we want to query hyperparameters that are good to start with uh, without doing some sort of random search and grid search for every new data set. And because optimal hyperparameters shift as data distribution changes, and there may be some periodicity, not all previous tasks are equally useful. So we have to, among the previous tasks, identify those that are equally useful, that are, that are most useful, sorry. Okay. So here's how we uh, start representing the data set, right? So the data set comes from some probability distribution, and in particular, it's a joint probability distribution of the inputs and the outputs. Okay. How do we usually think about performance measure? We think of performance measure as some notion of an empirical risk, say on a held out data set, computed like that, right? L is some loss function, H sub theta is the model's predictor, so that's what the machine learning model gives me for given hyperparameter theta. Uh, and so what are the sources of variability here? Well, hyperparameters are source of variability, but also this joint distribution, px5, of the data is a source of variability because what this is trying to do is just estimate some expectation over PXY. And another source of variability, of course, is also sample size because you would expect different performance measures for different sizes of samples. Um, so thus, what we will do, we will build a joint Gaussian process model on the hyperparameters, joint distributions, and sample sizes, assuming that F varies smoothly in all of these arguments. And they are very uh, different and complex uh, types of arguments, right? So one of them is a a probability distribution itself. So actually considering sample size as an input 
to performance measure has already been done in the literature, but in a different context, uh, where this paper Klein et al. Uh, considers how to speed up Bayesian optimization by evaluating performance measure on smaller data sets. Uh, but basically, we take some of the model choices from, from that paper. Okay, so what do I have to do? I have to now build a joint Gaussian process model on hyperparameters, joint distributions, and sample sizes. So for that, I need a covariance function across all of these uh, arguments. And in particular, we will use a product covariance function. So there will be a, just a standard covariance on hyperparameters. Fine, that's, that's the usual stuff. That's what we take from the paper by Klein et al. The covariance function on the sample sizes itself. And our contribution is this term here, which is the covariance function taking particular features of the joint distributions of inputs and outputs across two tasks um, as arguments. Okay. So that representation inside psi, representation of a probability distribution, we will learn. We will learn it in a particular structured way uh, using deep learning framework. Um, and you see immediately that on this kind of very complex problem, uh, this is essential because you need to learn representations of probability distributions because there is a lot of irrelevant variability in probability distributions that's not going to be relevant for the problem of hyperparameter learning. Uh, for example, uh, similar distributions imply similar performance measures but not vice versa because uh, Hyperparameters could be invariant to lots of different variations in uh, probability distributions of the data. So you can imagine that, for example, length scales are invariant to rotations in the data. And things like that. Okay, so hence, uh, in order to build this invariance, it's very important to learn this representation. Okay. Okay, so how is this, I've, I've talked already about warm starting Bayesian optimization, so how is this actually done in practice? So this is the framework of auto ML. Yeah? Uh, how do I identify similar tasks? I identify similar tasks using meta features. What are those meta features? Uh, various statistics of the data, right? I compute some things like skewness, kurtosis, correlations, do PCA, then compute some statistics afterwards. And lots of different things I could do. And then uh, I stick all of these into one big vector and then I look at what tasks are actually similar. That will allow me to take hyperparameters that I've learned for those previous tasks and warm start my Bayesian optimization from there. Okay, so I emphasize this doesn't consider joint modeling, it's just how to initialize Bayesian optimization. Okay, and that's uh, to, to somebody who's been working on kernel methods, uh, this looks a little bit suspicious because what I'm doing, I'm just actually extracting some features in a very ad hoc way and sticking to one big vector. Maybe I could do something a bit more principal. And that's the basic idea. We will repre replace this representation using meta features with kernel embeddings. And not only did we use this notion of similarity with previous tasks to initialize, we'll actually build a joint model. Right, so uh, the framework of kernel mean embeddings gives us lots of different ways to go about this, and some of these would be applicable in some situations, some in others. Uh, for example, what kind of features of the joint distribution I could use? Well, I could represent marginal distributions of inputs. Marginal distributions of inputs could be very important because if my hyperparameters correspond to some complexity measures, then noisier covariates will require less complex models because of being prone to overfit with noisier covariance. I could go for conditional distributions because conditional distributions capture smoothness of the regression functions, say. And a lot of hyperparameters would directly correspond to smoothness of regression functions. Or I could just go for joint distribution itself. So of course, uh, marginal and conditional put together represent the same information as the joint, uh, but it's useful if the hyperparameters have these specific meanings to decouple these and feed them as features uh, to, to the model directly. Okay. Uh, 
So uh, this is just uh, the, the overall thing. So I kind of already uh, hinted what we're doing. So we will learn feature presentation. Uh, and uh, okay, so yeah, so we will fit uh, GP on all performance evaluations we've done across all the previous tasks. It will be a joint GP. Uh, then we will take an acquisition function that corresponds only to the target. So I'm evaluating acquisition function only at the target because that's, that's the only thing I care about at this point. I will uh, give proposals for the new hyperparameters in this way using the joint model. Okay? So of course you could sort of question this and say this is all a bit crazy because you're using this joint GP across all the possible uh, evaluations and indeed that could be very expensive. Uh, because joint GP model comes at a higher computational cost. Uh, so what you do in practice is resort to Bayesian linear regression on these learned feature maps, which kind of makes complete sense because if we're learning feature maps already, then there's nothing really special about the kinds of kernels that we might want to put on top of those feature maps. So with Bayesian linear regression, which is equivalent to Gaussian processes for finite dimensional uh, feature maps, uh, time and storage is linear in the number of evaluations. Thank you. Uh, so let me just give you some experiments. So these are some various baselines. Um, so the first one uses manual uh, Bayesian optimization. So this uses these meta features that I've talked about. Then there's multi-BO, which also uses a Bayesian linear, uh, uh, linear regression, but with no meta information. Each task is essentially encoded by its index but the representation of hyperparameters is shared across tasks. Then there's this warm starting business, plain Bayesian optimization, random search. Thank you. So I think in the interest of time, I will uh, skip through this example. So uh, just a, a quick, quick summary here is that this example uh, makes the relevant feature of the data being the mean of the inputs itself. Okay, which is encoded using these manual uh, uh, meta features, and hence manual meta features do really well here. And we learn the representation of the data set that's relevant for hyperparameter learning, and we do as well, whereas all the other methods lack. Thank you. Uh, this is an example where these meta features fail uh, because of the way. Uh, because of the way hyperparameters interact with the data distribution. In particular here, um, so I, the, the, the stuff is actually not, uh, not completely important in the details here, but what's going on is that it's, in, in, my, in my data set there are certain covariates that follow a three variable interaction. All covariates are pairwise independent, but there are three of them that are actually dependent jointly. And it's the choice of those three that, that actually regulates which covariates are, uh, are important for predicting the response. Uh, and hence, if you're using something like a Gaussian ARD kernel on here, where hyperparameters correspond to length scale across different dimensions, so that they're actually selecting relevant features, it will be important to pick up those three uh, dimensions that are dependent. And because meta features never look at this third order information, they only look at correlations and first order information, they just don't, don't see these features of the data set and we, we managed to uh, successfully learn them. And this is uh, an example in protein data classification. So again, uh, it's able to uh, few shot hyperparameters across these different tasks. So here tasks correspond to various proteins um, and it's a cl binary classification problem where binary label correspond to whether uh, a molecule can bind to the target protein and so on. Okay, so I think, uh, I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll just give a conclusion for this, uh, this part of the talk. Uh, so what I've talked about is the method to borrow strength between multiple hyperparameter learning tasks by making use of the similarity between training data sets. Uh, this allows few shot hyperparameter learning, especially if similar prior tasks are present. Uh, so what's important as a distinction of this method from the prior work is that it has this joint model across the tasks and hence it can propose useful hyperparameters without seeing absolutely any evaluations on the target task. So the prior work typically has 
a model for each of the tasks, but shares representations across tasks. So it still requires some initial exploration, and we don't. Um, and I've said that this is towards opening the black box of hyperparameter learning, uh, considering model performance as a function of all sources of variability, not just hyperparameters. And then it's natural to consider extensions where we're solving multiple tasks jointly, but there are some choices there that are not completely clear. So uh, I will just um, I think let me just give you a summary. So I, I, I totally uh, ran over time, so I, I didn't talk about the second application at all. But this is the summary for the whole talk. So what I believe in is that uh, statistical modeling can be brought to bear in tandem with machine learning, that it's not one or the other, it's actually together, uh, working together where you get interesting things. And this is part, I guess, of increasing confluence between statistics and ML, where you build bespoke statistical models using, using well-engineered machine learning infrastructure, deep learning frameworks. Uh, and I see this flexibility of, of the framework of, of kernel methods as a common ground between machine learning and statistical inference. And again, I will give you just a reference. So I talked about the first paper, so this more recent work about conditional density estimation, the preprint is available, so sorry that I ran over. Any questions? <laughs> Little over time, so if anyone has any burning questions, yes. Hey, so um, in one of the examples you gave for the online learning, you have uh, tons of data, and it makes absolute sense for hyperparameter learning transfers. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel each time. In uh, the other setting where you have to pay for your data, the model is usually uh, training data, safe some aside validation. Um, which is the hyperparameter uh, yeah. optimization, and then testing. And when you're doing your validation, you're not allowed to look at the testing That's stuff. Right. And when you're doing your uh, training, you're not allowed to look at your validation. Now, in, in, your, uh, in your proposal, if I understood it correctly, there was using elements of the testing uh, outputs, be they sets or subsets of the, of the, of the, of the overall set, in what can really be described as part of the, the validation step. Yeah. Um, can you convince us that you're not doing anything naughty there and looking at stuff uh, that you shouldn't no, that's, be? Uh, that, that, that's an absolutely fair point. I've swiped a lot of details uh, about specific in implementation uh, under the carpet. So let me just go back to uh, where was it? this slide, right? So this is happening inside the box, inside the machine learning method. It's doing these splits. It's doing cross-validation maybe and giving you a performance measure at the end, right? This could be computed on the test data set and it's just final test measure. It could be cross-validation measure. I don't care about that. So now the question is, what data set should I use for my representation, my feature representation of the task? And it doesn't have to be a test data set. It can be a training data set. It's just something to, to represent the probability distribution. So I'm thinking about this quantity as a function of the underlying probability distribution PXY, and now I just need a sample from that probability distribution. So this could be the training set, and indeed, in particular, we will just use the small subsamples of the training set to build these feature maps <coughs> that are inputs to the joint GPU. Uh, but I mean, my question is the um, when you when you've trained when you've trained your um, when you've trained your model, the parameters that are the, the regular parameters, not the hyperparameters, they um, they should only be linked to that set. But if you have, uh, let's say, information encoded from the validation set in your hyperparameters, can that affect, can that affect your training value? Uh, is, it, is, it, is it, when you're training, is it a bit like you've peeked at some aspect of the other data? Do you see what I mean? No, I, I totally understand. I think, I, 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 yeah, there is some dependence uh, across, but I think it's, it's relatively weak dependence, I especially... I think it's very, very weak, but I mean, yeah, we're extremely yes. strict, I and mean, it yes. feels to me like there might be an element of teaching, but yes. we can brush it under the uh, So, in practice, we just take a small subsample of the training set. Yeah? So that that should be uh, all legit, but, uh, but yeah, I think that's a, that's, a that, that's a choice to be made, and it's not 
entirely clear. We haven't really investigated that trade off there. Right. Gina, I'm really sorry, but we're uh, running a little right? bit late. Are, are you sticking around for Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Okay, so if anyone has any more <coughs> questions, please come and talk to her. Gina, yes. otherwise we're going to have a 12 minute break and then we'll be back for the next talk. Thanks a lot. Thanks Cheers. again. Thanks. Thanks.